I don't know about you guys, but if I was just listening to this stuff about libel and, uh, you know, hearing really the potential that we have to print falsehoods, uh, making mistakes and uh, getting sued for them, I'd, I'd be a little nervous. So I'm here to alleviate a little bit of your concern in the sense that there are defenses against libel and uh, there are ways that you're protected that the court has established already, um, these protections based on the circumstances that go into reporting. So let's take a look at them. Let's try a little for instance here. So let's say that you're a newspaper columnist and that you are at a school board hearing investigating neglect maybe or for wrongdoing on the part of somebody who works for the school. And in your column, you say that people lied at the hearing. And one of the people who was at the, the hearing, uh, one of the accused, says the allegation is false and that it damages his reputation and he sues you and your newspaper for libel. And you say that it's expression of opinion and protected by the First Amendment. Is it? Well, that was pretty much the case here with Milkovich versus the Lorraine Journal. Uh, this is a case right here in Ohio where a high school wrestling match ended up in a pretty big fight. And um, the coach of uh, one of the teams, Mike Milkovich, said that uh, it was the referees had made bad calls. And that's pretty much what people believe caused the fight. So the school was put on probation and it couldn't take part in the next year's state wrestling tournament. So the wrestlers and their parents filed suit. And this reporter for the Mentor News Herald wrote about the decision in a column, and he said it was his opinion that Milkovich had lied under oath during the judicial proceedings. Well, Milkovich sues him for defamation and accuses him of damaging his reputation. What do you think happened? These are some of the cases that have helped to shape uh, our understanding of libel and what well, the court actually decided here for Milkovich, and what they established was the idea of a false idea. So even though the article had been written as a column, and column by definition is an opinion in some way, these were facts that were presented that could have been proven or disproven, the idea of Milkovich committing perjury. So the fact that they could have been confirmed, that wasn't opinion, and the court ruled that, in fact, this was not protected by the First Amendment. Now, one of the defenses of libel that the court has established has to do with what we call innocent construction. And basically that means that if there are two meanings behind a statement and one is libel and one is not, as long as there exists one non-defamatory meaning, then the defendant can win the case and, and the statement can be deemed not to be libelous. So uh, it's really a matter of interpretation and, and the reasonableness of that interpretation. The fact is, is that not all inaccurate information is liable, and how the reporting's conducted, how we um, establish something to be factual, how we transmit that, all of those things will contribute to libel, but recognize that it, it do, just because something's inaccurate doesn't mean it's libelous. Fair reporting is one of the ways that we can protect ourselves from libel. What this means is that you've gotten the information from an official record of some sort. So if you get it uh, within a court document or uh, some documentation that has been filed with the city, um, as long as you are fairly and accurately reporting what is in the public record or what's said in official proceedings like a meeting or um, a court hearing or something like that, then that information is protected against libel. The source of the statement has to be clearly noted. So this is why attribution is so important in journalism, because not only do we need to indicate uh, you know, who said something and where the information came from, but it needs to be confirmable that we reported the information that we received accurately. The idea of the, the fair reporting protection is really all about context. You know, we need to keep citizens informed about things that are a matter of public concern. Um, so we need to be able to report on the official business without having to prove the truth of what the government says all the time. And certainly we do want to be proving uh, the truth of their statements. But um, on first report, as long as we're reporting things uh, without malice and we're reporting them fairly and accurately, even though they may end up to be inaccurate in the long run, it will protect us against libel. Now, further protection comes in what we call absolute privilege, and this means that if uh, someone makes a statement within the performance of their duty, so a police chief uh, is giving a press conference and he makes a statement, or a politician in some way, and you report it fairly and accurately, even though that information may be wrong and it may be defamatory, you are protected from libel because uh, reporting within the course of someone doing their official duty for the service of the public. 
Now, absolute privilege is uh, basically offers you exemption from liability um, for anything that you're reporting on that has been uh, even. If, now, conditional or qualified privilege applies when uh, you're reporting on judicial uh, coverage. So, you know, testimony, depositions, arguments, trials. Um, when that information is open to the public and you report, again, fairly and accurately, about information that may end up to be false, you are still protected against libel because you're reporting the proceedings as they go on. Now, understanding about uh, opinion and uh, fair comment and criticism. Um, the, these offer us some protection from libel provided that we do them the right way. Um, so the goal is is that it's going to protect critics from lawsuits. Um, and it's not really the same as a public figure, but it can cover people who kind of move in and out of the public eye. So people who are writers or artists or uh, restaurateurs, um, if you make uh, fair comments about them or criticism about the performance of their duties, uh, you are are protected from libel provided that you uh, base it in some degree of evidential fact and you reflect it that it is your opinion. So, you know, we're looking at um, any expression of opinion on matters of legitimate public interest, basically, your opinion of the speaker, um, you know, statements that are not made solely to cause harm, and really, you know, the expression of opinion and not false statements of fact. Now, neutral reportage is another area which will protect us, and it's designed to protect the press who are reporting on you know, areas in public interest which uh, has one person uh, pitted against the other in, in the public sphere as a public figure. Uh, I, I will forewarn you that not all states recognize this, but in those states that do, um, they really will apply neutral reportage when it's some prominent organization or individual, and then they're making kind of a series of charges that are a matter of public interest against someone else in the public eye, um, and the charge is accurately reported and neutrally reported. So you're not taking sides, but you're just providing an accurate representation of what was done. And remember, one of the criteria of libel is that it has to be published. Um, and the statute of limitations when it comes to print begins to run when the defamatory statement is first published. So all it takes is one publication. And if the content is republished to a different audience, then a new statute of limitations will apply. Now, most states, uh, when it comes to the web, have applied the same rule uh, to the Internet that the statute of limitations begins when the statement is first made available online. Um, and, you know, the same thing can apply. So if you put a tweet out and then, um, you know, two years later it's retweeted, the publication comes back uh, into play. And we actually have uh, a protection for libel by basically a libel-proof plaintiff, so someone whose reputation is so tarnished that they actually can't be defamed. Um, you know, this is Anna Nicole Smith and her attorney. Uh, they were uh, certainly um, entering into that sphere of just such an outlandish lifestyle that it was it was really hard to consider their reputation damageable. Uh, the most noteworthy case here, Cardillo versus Doubleday, a convicted mobster wanted to sue about a biography that was being written about him, and uh, it turned out that the court ruled that he was libel-proof because it's unlikely that, you know, uh, publishing disparaging remarks about someone who's a convicted mobster is really um, going to damage their reputation too much. And we also take into account, you know, how many mistakes does a reporter make? I mean, if it's one mistake that you make and it's not, um, you know, a habit that you make, it, chances are that it's not going to be considered to be um, libels is something that you're going to be able to fight. Um, stories that suggest that you, uh, there's a string of mistakes, um, that's something that really can enter into the sphere of libel. So, you know, it's important to remember that our goal is ultimately to tell the truth, to report fairly and accurately and neutrally, um, but to recognize that uh, in the event that, that somebody does challenge uh, damage that you may have done to their reputation, there is some protection out there for you.